Previously on AgentPalmer.com, did Anderegg's nerds reveal Tom Bombadil to be my shibboleth? Villain shit, you don't have to be bad to look cool, and if Rob wants to have his head in the clouds, I'll be happy to greet him when he lands. This is The Palmer Files, episode 95 with Charles Bates, who you may know as Chaz, Yazik, the DM, or the Bard. We discuss his many hats and projects, his creative pursuits, a few fandoms, reading, the abundance of choice, and so much more. Are you ready? Let's do the show! Welcome to the Palmer Files. I'm your host, Jason Sturchuk, also known as Agent Palmer, and on this 95th episode is the DM, the Bard, Chaz, Yazik, the man, the myth, the legend, Charles Bates. Perhaps you have heard of one of those names, all of which he'll answer to, or perhaps not, so let me explain. Charles is the DM in a series of videos on the YouTube channel Man Shorts, that's M-A-N-N Shorts. That channel also hosts a series titled Drunk Before Noon and many other videos. If you enjoy this conversation, you should definitely check out the channel. Also on that channel and on other podcast platforms, you'll find him as the bard in his podcast, Bard Advice. And of course, there's his music where he creates albums as Yazik. We do touch on many of these pursuits throughout the conversation you're about to hear, but we also discuss being storytellers and artists, the desire for discovery, the abundance of choice, the concept that perhaps rational people don't create art, and separating art from the artist. All of that and a whole lot more is coming your way shortly, but first, remember that if you want to discuss this episode as you listen or afterwards, you can find all contact information for Charles and myself in the show notes. You can watch Charles' content on the Man Shorts channel on YouTube, that's M-A-N-N Shorts. There you can find the D&D editions, Drunk Before Noon, and the video of his podcast, Bard Advice. You can also listen to his music on YouTube or Spotify by looking up Yazik, that's Y-A-H-Z-I-C-K. Don't forget, you can see all of my writings and rantings on agentpalmer.com. And of course, email can be sent to thepalmerfiles at gmail.com. So without further ado, roll for initiative. Charles, I know you as many things, but I have to ask, like, when you walk into a room, and, and a just general room, right, not a specific room, like, is there one hat you want people to know you wear more than any other not particularly <laughs> uh i guess that charles is great uh charles uh, charles i know and respond to the most often probably because my wife calls me charles okay um but i mean it really depends on who's in the room i'll answer to whatever you throw out there <laughs> but like do you want people to know like i'm a rapper i'm an artist i'm a writer i'm a guy on youtube writer like- writer I like I like that that's a good question um yeah because I do do a lot of stuff um there's a lot of different hats that I wear and a lot of different things that I do and a lot of different streams of creation and income and it's a little all over the place so I I don't want to be known as a rapper although I do rap I don't consider myself a rapper I consider myself a writer who raps Uh, okay I mean look I've been I've got into this place where if you are a content creator, which is a word I absolutely, two words I absolutely despise, like you're just, yeah. to me, I would simplify it as you're just an artist. Um, yeah. Yeah. That, Cause I, I like writing. That's a good one. I like, th- I think the writing aspect of that kind of leans into all of it. Yeah. You know, I had a, uh, I, I got my, I got new glasses recently. And when I was at the optometrist and I was filling out the paperwork, I put bard under op- occupation and I didn't even think about it. I just did it. And then as I handed it back to the receptionist, I thought, you know, that's actually kind of great because <laughs> that's really what I am. I mean, that's what I do. I'm, I'm earning my income through one form of entertainment or another. So, sure. I mean, what is that if not a bard? That's, yeah. I mean, I guess then do, do you, 
you're a bard in real life, but when you role play, do you also play a bard? <laughs> yeah, I like support stuff. Honestly, most of my experience with PCs uh, have been uh, have been tanks. Okay, have been um, like either tanks or DPS doing uh, fighters, like a lot of three five fighters, um, and. Uh, if it's support, it's usually like druid. I mean, you could tank as a druid in three five too, so it's that's true. fun. It's true. I the the I have to tell you, I think you might be. Well, you may not want to be a rapper. You might be my favorite rapper. Well, thank you. That that's high praise. It's, I appreciate. It's that. not. <laughs> it's not a genre that ever really. I think. I th- and look. I th- I think this is this is the compliment you want. I think is the writing because it's not that the beats. Uh, uh, you know, I'm I'm I I'm a wannabe musician. I'm a bass player that can dabble in guitar and 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 drums, but like, it's the words that connect with me. Like, I can that's a nice beat, that's fine, but I don't care about the song because it I don't relate to it. And then yeah, I heard your stuff, and it I like the beat, and I can relate to it. So I feel like it's definitely the writing there that's kind of brought you to me yeah i mean i'd say so the i've always written i wrote when i was a kid i got published when i was a kid like in a in like a book of poetry like i mean not not that i'm boasting it wasn't a huge deal i just mean like it was something that i liked and was good at early in life so i kind of have always done it and then everything that i've done has been kind of an extension of that so like in high school i had a ska band and then there was a while there where we had a what started as an emo screamo band that eventually evolved into like a four piece red hot chili peppers, incubus funk situation. But all of that stuff was, you know, centered around the writing aspect. And just like with rap, like that's how I consume hip hop. That's the kind of rap I listen to is conscious where it's, and and I actually kind of like it about the music. Cause a lot of people that, that I talk to that don't listen to hip hop are like, well, you know, it's kind of repetitive and it's like, yeah, but that's the point because you're not so focused on what they're doing musically. It allows you to focus on the words yeah. and commercially that's not so fun, but there's a lot of really, really gifted rappers out there that have a lot of really great, smart, wise things to say. I, I like the idea that, it was like early poetry that started for you because yes. I like, yeah, it's not a badge of honor necessarily because we were children and we didn't really know better, but like I got a poem. <laughs> yeah. I got like a fifth grade poem in like the local paper or whatever. Yeah. Right? And, man, I, that's and then awesome. you, you just end up as a, I mean, look, it's a long journey. It's not like just uh, every day. This was always what I was going to do, but you just end up as a storyteller somehow. I I'm writing and talking now, but that's what I do. And that's kind of where it started. Cause like, you know, I wasn't the kid who only wrote in class. Like I, I wrote as a kid, like, yeah, I got notebooks around with like poems yeah, and stuff. Man. Unf- yeah. a, a billion unfinished short stories. <laughs> like, did you like to read? Were you a reader as a kid? Yes. And then it stopped, which by the way, I cannot pinpoint when it stopped and then it started again. Right. I think, Oh, good for you. I I think it was, um, yeah. So I don't know when I stopped. I just know like I'm, I'm at college and not really a reader. Like there's the forced reading and stuff, but I wasn't a reader. And then like my, my senior year, I started like, people would be like, what are you doing? Like I'm reading because like my my senior year, like I was an overachiever. So I had a lot of extra classes in the early part mm. of my undergrad. So like when I got to my senior year, I didn't I, I had like three classes like I didn't have it. So I'm I'm reading for myself just to fill time, I guess, or to get back into it or whatever. And like that starts a trickle down where then like seven years later, I actually become like a full fledged reader again, which kind of takes me back to what I was in like middle school. Um, during the formative it's, years when I became like a geek and was playing like early magic and early D and D and like yeah. Spellfire and all like any, any, any geek thing that I could get my hands on basically. And so I've kind of come full circle, but like there's a dead period in there and I don't know what, like I, I, I don't know what happened. <laughs> I know. I I, I kind of live in that period now. It's kind of it's kind of a shame because, you know, I I consumed a bunch when I was a kid, and I was you know 
again, not to be braggy, but just it's how it was. Like I, I always was reading a little above my level. Sure. And so as a result, like by the time I got to high school, most of all of the stuff that we were like introduced to in class, I had already read or I had at least like known of. Sure. Um, and so, you know, I don't know what it was like after, you know what it is really? It's probably the ADHD. It's really difficult for me to focus on stuff, man. It's really hard. It, and it's gotten easier. I've gotten better at it. But um, it's it's got to be something that really captivates me. Now, I have been reading manga lately, which, hey, I think that counts. I mean, I got to tell you, I have fallen in love with Japanese. I've re-fallen in love with Japanese storytelling again in the last, like, year and a half. So do you have, like, but you can just read manga without a problem like i mean would it be yeah so is it just well i guess the question would be (laughs) do do you do you have a a a strict like i have to finish this kind of a deal or like if i put a book in your hand and you were like "Ah, i'm feeling this i'll finish it or like i'm not it's okay i'm I'm gonna leave it go i will put a book down i left the harry potter series i never started let's talk about that (laughs) oh you didn't no no like i i you and I are about the same age, and so I I was a little too old. I say I say uh, okay. I was a little too old for the target demographic because I, I can't say I'm too old because my mother read the series, right? So it's like right, hard right. to do. But like I just kind of had moved on to other things at that point. So like I know, oh, yeah, there were people around me um, and our age that did get in. I was just like. Um, I'm fine. Like I, I think for the, there's a, there's a generation of us who read Tolkien way too early. <laughs> Yo. Yeah. <laughs> and, dude. And so wow. going what a succinct way of putting it. <laughs> yeah. I mean, but just going backward, it felt like, I don't know, maybe because of the way it was marketed. Maybe if it was just like, here's this wizard book, you might be interested. I might've picked it up, but it was so like, why would I read a kid's book? Like that's where I was at that yeah. point in my life. Yeah, I can see that. I think I was like nine or 10. Um, and I unfortunately wasn't introduced to Tolkien until like seventh grade because we actually re- were assigned to read The Hobbit in seventh grade. And then my dad or or rather my stepdad, but I call him my dad. My dad uh, introduced me to the trilogy because he was like, well, if you think that shit's cool, <laughs> take a look at this. That, and that's like, about oh, when I started. Awesome. Six, sixth grade. I read the uh, well, uh, maybe fifth grade. My father was reading The Hobbit to me as like, mm. like to get me to read. And then by the time sixth grade rolls around, I think I finished The Return of the King on my own. Um, it's just so dense and so good that it's almost like it makes me feel like that those astronauts that go to space and then they're supposed to come back and just live life like it's normal. <laughs> it's like when you're if you're 12 and you read this epic yeah. story and then it's like nothing else is ever probably going to be close or I mean, certainly not the same. Oh, no, 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 no. And I. So I've been reading more of late uh, mainly because I got um, let go from my job and I was like, I'm going to use this time wisely. And then the pandemic yeah. hit and I'm like, I'm going to keep using this time wisely. And I just kept reading. Um, but like in the last maybe five or six years, I started a friend of mine. Fe- he, he's a, a fellow Tolkien fan, but he was also a Terry Brooks fan. And he's like, you have to read the Shannara stuff. And I was like, Okay, like I'll I'll do it, and so I kind of read like the fr- the the main um, anthologies, like the first and the first three trilogies. One of them's got four in it, um, and a whole bunch of that stuff. So like, I I but I think I needed to be in the right place to read them because they're like not quite as dense as Tolkien, and so you have to come at it with an open mind. Yes. And that's my this is my kryptonite is making sure my mind is open. <laughs> Because like I can I can like almost anything, but it's all about how I feel when I open the book. Like I have to be like, yeah, all right, like let's open, like let's do this, and make sure that like okay we're good. Like I watched recently for the first time the Batman, the the the, mm. new, the newest. Batman. Oh, the newer one. Yeah, I've not seen it yet. I'm not. I'm not of like I need to be in the mood to watch a dark DC 
gritty film. Just like I need yeah, to be I in the mood that. to watch a horror film. So like we finished it and I was like, nah, it's not, I, I just don't, either my mind wasn't open or I just wasn't in the mood. Like, I'm not saying it's a bad film. It just didn't hit me right at the time. And I think that's what yeah. I struggle with is uh, I, I know I'm my own worst enemy for that. Like I know I'm putting up blinders when I try and experience new things. Yeah. I I'm, I'm less that way about content. Um, cause I'll kind of consume anything. The, the, the reason that I think I'm that way about like being open to consume anything is because I have like a secret desire of discovery. Okay. Um, so I just like the idea of, uh, I don't know, like being the first to introduce something to my friends, you know, that it's always kind of cool. And as a result also, like I've always felt in my life as like an underdog. So I always have related to underdogs. So like, especially if something is established as an underdog, like if people are hating on a show or a movie or something, I'm checking that out because like, <laughs> I'm going to give not to mention, I don't always, I find, I've found myself several times in my life, butting heads with the general populace in terms of like what is good or quality or enjoyable. Um, so I, t I try and keep my eye out for like, hidden gems. And then sometimes I just blatantly miss stuff. Like my wife and I just discovered for the first time and have been watching Shit's Creek, which is just like in its simplicity, brilliant. Eugene Levy is just a genius. And he has a new show too, uh, where he's, it's called, uh, the reluctant traveler <laughs> on Apple TV, where he, it's just like him traveling around the world. Like one of those Rick Steves guys, just like doing informational stuff about travel, but it's Eugene Levy. So he's like <laughs> prissy and complaining the whole time. And I love it. Like that's my whole aesthetic. See, I, there, there's two things. One, when it comes to discovery, I'm all about discovering it within the thing. Like, this is why I don't really do trailers and I try not to read book covers because they give a, I, I think that we're in a world where we give away too much in order to sell the thing. And I yes. want to discover, like I, the twist might be on the back cover, but I want to experience it in the book on page 50 and not in the second paragraph of the synopsis on the back of the book. So like, that's where my right. discovery is. But like, I know Shit's Creek is brilliant. People tell me I'll like it, but there's a lot of stuff out there. <laughs> And right. there's just so much. And like, um, I don't want to throw you under the bus, but like man shorts was something that was like on our periphery, like within my YouTube algorithm for a while. And then I was like, look, I've liked almost everything I've seen from these guys. Let's just do it. And so my partner, Stephanie and I, we just, we just watched all your stuff. Oh, but, cool. but here's the thing. She's got a full-time job. So there's only so much stuff I can watch without her. So it took us a mm -hmm. while, but like we watch these things together. And so that means that we can't get to Shit's Creek or we can't get like, look. Uh, yeah. When, and, and then Marvel puts out a thing and we get behind on Marvel. And then Star Wars puts out a thing and we get behind on Star. Like it's just, Dude, there's I haven't so much. seen a Marvel or a Star Wars movie in years. But and the, t the TV series, like I, I know they're all great or so people tell me, but like I, mm -hmm. I. It feels like a full-time job. Like, th these are some of my fandoms. I have a lot of fandom. I still haven't watched Rings of Power. Yeah. Like, Dude, it's about to get a lot worse, I hate to tell you. No, because I, once AI gets involved, they're going to ha just have 24-7 stream of the Star Wars universe. And it's going to be some people's job to sit and curate the best moments of that for reproduction or redistribution rather on the other formats. See, like, I, I wonder though, like I feel like that could be where we're going, but I also feel like we're wait, I'm waiting for the streaming implosion, which seems to be happening where I think like the thing people forget about like TV that we've gotten away from is that some of the crappy programs that filled the hour <laughs> or hours yeah. from the networks paid for those networks. And so like, yeah, it's great that you decided that Peacock's your thing and you love N NBC or like Paramount's your thing and you love CBS. But the benefit was go not going from one show to another, but from checking out what was on NBC, ABC, CBS, like channel surfing in itself was not like ADHD. It, it wasn't like, you know, whatever, but it was a way to browse. <laughs> across yeah. companies and i think that they're you know 
you and I may like similar things or different things, but they all prop up the same general cable infrastructure. And that kind of gone away and i think we're seeing how rough that can be when people are like well i only watch cbs for this one thing so i'm not buying them yeah you know it's funny that you bring that up too because you know youtube has actually it looks like we've already overcorrected because i've got so i work with a guy i work part-time at a vape shop uh just so that i like you know supplemental income and it gets me out of the house lets me communicate with human beings so sure. it's just something i like to do but this new kid that we just hired is 21 and i have loved it because i've been able to have these conversations and really kind of like pick his brain as to like how he sees it and what his experience is yeah. and it's just been so interesting and he was telling me about youtube tv and it's just so funny because it's like, you know, it's like, I'm sorry, did a Zoomer just sell me cable? <laughs> like, what, what what just happened? Because really, that's what it is. Like, he was explaining it to me and he was like, yeah, bro, you got to get it, man. Because, like, it, you get ESP, you get all the, like, regular channels, but then you also get, like, you know, anything that's on Hulu or, like, Paramount Plus. He's like, there's a list that has, like, a breakdown of... And it's like, you know, it's like whatever it is, 60 bucks a month. And it's like, well, how is this any different than cable? It's, this is this is cable. Yeah. Which, look, I'm not mad at it. If it's, you know, I'm going to, I've been actually looking into it. And if it's worth the money, I might very well make some switches because my God, my wife and I have every streaming thing there is, I think, except Peacock. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty close. I'm pretty close to that because I, we, we have Sling, which we, when we cut the oh, okay. cable, um, but like, I still have my local cable because I want my like local channels, um, mm-hmm. which is very specific. Because I, and I'm not talking like local channel. I'm talking like local, like channel two, like whatever your local, not ABC, right. not like an unaffiliated local channel. And, yeah, yeah, yeah. And they 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 do the arts program and like the local sports and college stuff. And and I I want that. But like, then we also have Disney and Hulu and ESPN Plus. So I've got that bundle. But we also have. Um, like Amazon Prime we pay for and Netflix we pay for. And like, I know and that yes, and BritBox and Apple. And it's, well, it's so funny because it's exactly what my dad and I posited would happen is that we would go to an a la carte system, but then, but then everything? Would, everything would cost you. Yeah. <laughs> so it would be like, you got to get your weather over here for five bucks a month and your comedy over here. for, t- And that's essentially what we're doing. Yeah. Like, yeah. Although I will say I, I save on BritBox because I bought a VPN. Oh, okay. So that was that. that nice. That's like the one play. But I pay for the VPN, so I don't know if I'm really right. saving. They get you. They get you, and uh, uh, they're gonna get you yeah. one way or another. You know. Well, and it's it. It goes back to like this ridiculous like abundance of choice, which is kind of too good, free. But I don't know. If- I think sometimes we suffer from being too free. Uh, yeah, Which some people might think that that's like really sacrilege or out of pocket for me to say, but I was thinking about it recently and I really do believe that like one of the things uh, far be it for me to shit on America. I love this country, but I will say that autonomy, freedom in some ways may have hurt us. Like, look at the car. OK, <laughs> like, look at the automobile. Sure. We should have we should have bullet trains in this country. Yeah. But we have, but we're so, it's so integrated now into this system of these cars. And it's like, just think about it realistically for a second. Like just from a statistical standpoint, it has to be the most inefficient system that you could possibly think of. Oh, it, it, yeah. But one of the problems is, and I live in a, in, in, in the Northeast where we've taken all of our old rail infrastructure and turned it into parks. So even if you wanted to reuse the infrastructure that was already there because we blasted holes through the mountain and we built right. the bridges, yes, that's fine. But then you get to land and there's a park. <sighs> and then, of course, you can't you couldn't possibly talk about getting rid of the park for the rail because then that's a whole nother problem. And we have some of those issues down in like Jacksonville with like the historical stuff. And it's like, look, I get it. You want to protect stuff that's historical, but also like maybe put in a drainage system down there in (laughs) Riverside, right? Because like it floods every time there's a hurricane and there's nowhere for that water to go. 
and it's just ultimately going to be disastrous for the city. I think that they are putting something in there, but truly, you there's so much red tape involved with doing anything with. I think it's called RAP. And I forget what it stands for, but it's like Riverside uh, 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 or Association of Protection or something. And it's like you have to get a permit and a write-off to do any kind of thing because it's all historical. Um, and again, I'm all for preservation of historical stuff, but at what cost? Like, you're going to flood your cities? That doesn't make sense to me. Well, and like I worry about – I mean I know you're in Florida – and I worry about, oh, yeah, I man. worry about Florida in particular, like, and I know people can go off on the politics of it, but like, I want to know, like, how high are you comfortable with your seawall being like if the, <laughs> because at a certain point, yeah. at a certain point, normally, let's say in the spring, the sun goes down at eight 30, but if you put up a high enough seawall as everything, the sun will go down at six, <laughs> Like, just because it'll be behind the seawall, right? And I, I wonder, like, yeah. at what point does it become, like, look, I'm in eastern Pennsylvania, and the joke <laughs> everybody here makes is that eventually Jersey will flood and we'll have waterfront property. And that's <laughs> it's fine for a joke, but at a certain point, yeah. you stop laughing and you go, oh, like, well... Yeah, it's been uh, it's been kind of crazy uh, just across the board the last couple of years in this state. And yeah, that's a genuine concern. Look, man, the only reason that I'm still here is because I have family here and my wife has family here. And if money were not a were not an issue, I would probably live in Switzerland. Okay, but um, that or at least Colorado. <laughs> <laughs> but um, that said, like. Yeah, I don't know. It's weird. I think that one of the things about this place, and it's certainly been put center stage these last few years, is that this state is kind of like one of the last bastions in the country of that like Wild West, do whatever you want to do, <laughs> you can't tell me what to do kind of attitude. Um, us in Texas are kind of holding that down. Yeah. Um, and then of course, Montana, but I mean, they're, you know, those well, people are doing their own thing. They're like, also importing Montana, Idaho. Yeah. But they're importing their, their, their crazy. It's not naturally grown. Yeah, So are we, man. <laughs> they're coming here. They've been coming here. Oh my gosh. I've seen more out of state tags in the last 12 months than I have in the last 10 years. People from South Carolina, New York. It's like, what are you doing here? Stop moving here. It's not. <laughs> it's not what you think it is. Let me just say that. Like, and also, what we don't ha what we don't pay in sales tax, yeah, we pay, or, or rather, state tax, we pay in all kinds of other stuff with this state. Yeah. Um. I mean, I yeah, I I love the people that like move around for taxes because it's like they they'll get the money out of you somewhere. Oh, it'll yeah, it'll man. if it's not retail, then you know when your friends come to visit and they stay in a hotel. <laughs> They'll get you in the hotel tax or they'll get you in the, yeah, the, the, the government, while it does us some good, will always find a way to get its money. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> man. It's honestly the, the, it's a great idea in theory, the government. Yeah, no, I the, mean, the, it's, it, it's it, all, it is. I think that it's, it's a matter of more efficient. That's why I've always butted headed heads with left and right, because it's like my friends on the left are like, we need more government. My friends on the right are like, we don't need any. And it's like, okay, but, but the reality is there's a middle ground there, right? Like we're, but you know, you can't get people. And now they're more divided than ever, I think, in terms of just like knee jerk, snap judgment reaction to letters. I think we should take letters off the people's names. Well, but they I, wouldn't do that. They wouldn't vote for that. Yeah, well, I I think there's a it it's all up to the generation after the kids that are in high school right now will determine everything, right? Like if they yeah. grow up if if enough of them grow up sick of the division, we might see some change in our lifetime. But if they grow up being indoctrinated into left and right mentalities, then nothing's going to change and i i don't i i, I told myself like i'm not going to pick up specific episodes of man shorts because it would be horrible to be like <laughs> well and that whatever <laughs> but you fine. but you have tackled many different things 
um, yeah. the left and the right and Florida and like like you've you've kind of played both sides. Which by the way I tried to like not for nothing, but having the left and the right be like back to back episodes. And they were essentially the same script. Like truly the the I I wrote the first one and then I reopened a new document with the original and went back through it and just changed whatever the argument, whatever the straw man was. Yeah. Because, and like the, the formula of the script, if you see, I mean, I'm sure you've seen it's, they're the same, which is the point, (laughs) you know, that's the whole point is that they're just mirror episodes. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I, I don't know. It's tough. I, I feel like as especially as I've gotten older, I feel like I feel like I, I'm starting to get a little bit out of touch. And I also like I've never been a person who wants to like hurt somebody or offend somebody. Sometimes I get into existential crises about stuff when it comes to like whether or not it like speaks to my character or whether or not people would assume that that makes me a quote unquote good or bad person. I don't know. It seems I'm I'm I'll say this. I've not ever cared about what others really think of me until I guess these last few years with this success with the channel and the music and stuff. Well, I guess the, the real question would be, does that hinder your ability to create? Cause like, I'll, I'll speak to, to me. Like I've always said that I'm not afraid of failure, but I am absolutely afraid of massive success. Like, yeah, yeah. I, it would be great to have, yeah. 200 or 300 or even a thousand people listen to every episode on release day. But anything more than that, where like it's a million, like every time like that, uh, I I don't know what, I don't know what it is about like that, like next level of success that scares me, but like I would much rather face plant. Yeah, well, we do, right? So we, 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 I mean, at least I do. I won't speak for you, but like my experience with that is that like, I, I definitely worry, I guess, too much. Well, I mean, I think we, I, no, no, I mean, I think we, but here's the thing. I think we all worry, right? I think the thing about the, the, the massive success and the massive failure is very different, but like in general, we've, <laughs> we've all failed a lot because as creatives, we all try a lot of things. Oh yeah. And so you have to, well, you have to. Yeah. And that, that's, that's what I was going to say about the uh, success thing is that like we self-sabotage as a result of that, because it's like, I know deep down that it's like, yes, there's a part of me that wants that, but like, there's a larger part of me that's like, I don't want that. <laughs> and maybe it's because of the fear of losing it. And maybe that's what I'm experiencing now, you know, because like this is probably the most successful. I'll say each year pretty much since 2016 has been better than the last for me in terms of like finance and exposure and just like what I'm doing with life. So um, and that's inclusive of all of the craziness that happened with the pandemic, you know, like that actually was a very weird silver lining for us because we did very well that year because everybody was at home watching YouTube. (laughs) So like, I guess it's me, I guess, reconciling like all of the stuff that's going on that it's like, okay, now that I have this, like you have to maintain it now that you have this, now that you've made this monster, you have to feed it. Um, and it's not always fun. Well, I, I guess the question would be, but you, but you just started a podcast within the last six months. And so like, it's not like you're not doing I mean, that's a new thing, right? Like potentially there's yeah. people out there that are like, well, it's not a new single from his next album and it's not a a D and D from man shorts or like a drunk before noon. So what the hell is he doing? Just talking like there, there was always a possibility, right? That it wouldn't work. And yet you still did it. So like how, I don't know, I guess as like the other guy, like how afraid could you be? You, you, you still did. Yeah. The yeah. Thing. Yeah. It's an obsession, I think, with, and I I encounter this with like my friend Justin is this way with the with the creatives. It's like you obsess so much about the piece, and then you release the piece, and it's like everybody look at it, and then everybody looks at it, and then there becomes this hole 
<laughs> this emptiness, this sor- this happens every week with me, man, with the additions. We put all of this work into, you know, putting the script together and having fun on shoot day and then doing the edit and I put it all together and I get it up there and then it releases and then there's this moment where everybody's, you know, praising and liking and sharing and that moment has gotten smaller and smaller over the years. And then that feeling of longing for the next thing has gotten heavier, which is why probably I've started these new things like the podcast and like Justin today dropped this uh, thing we're going to start doing where we create D&D characters based on existing people or characters. So he made Rick Moranis a D&D character. <laughs> Um, and I want to do John Candy and like John McClane from Die Hard. And like, there's a bunch of them that I want to do too. But I mean, like, yeah, it's just that idea of like, keep, keep going. I, and I want to let you know, you're not alone. And I'm going to tell a story that some of the regular listeners have heard, but my buddy, I helped my buddy make a movie, a, a, a legit 93 minute, a documentary full length, right? Nice. <laughs> We're at the, we did the premiere and like, a bunch of the friends that came to the premiere with us, we go out to this like barcade type thing. And I literally leaned over. I went, so what's next? Right? Like I gave him an hour after the premiere ended before I was like, what's next? Now a a little backstory, like we've worked on a lot of projects together. We've kind of started like some design and marketing agencies together. And he's with me weekly a bit as an, as a somewhat mostly editor on the blog. And, you know, so we always do these little projects, really small projects, kind of like man shorts where you're doing the one and then you always have a next one. So we did one big one and I was like, yeah, what's next? Like I, I, I'm with you in that, like, yeah, it was like six months of like intense editing. And then all of a sudden it's gone and you're like, well, hold on, I should be doing something else. And I think it is purely just the creative mind. I don't think yes. it's, which by the way, is not rational because rational people don't create art in my, in my <laughs> yeah. experience. That's not yeah. like, <laughs> well, that's the thing too. I, I've said that too before to my wife and talking about this stuff. It's that it's like, uh, you know, cause she's, she made a point one time where it was like, you know, you don't always seem happy with the thing. And I was like, yeah, but I feel like if I was, I wouldn't keep making stuff. You know, that's kind of like, if you, like we recently within the last year went and saw that Van Gogh exhibit that was going around the country. The the live one. Yeah. Yeah. It was super cool. And it was me and her and my mom went and did it. And, you know, obviously Van Gogh's life is tragic and just, you know, so much just like, oh man, a lot of those poor guys just untreated mental illness. But Like with Van Gogh in particular, it's just like you can tell through his story and like how he lived his life and what he was doing. It was there was just this longing (laughs) and and it's kind of across the board. You can find it in Shakespeare and Poe and you could probably even break it down with the with Trey Parker and Matt Stone or the guys from It's Always Sunny. Like there's a longing. Yeah. That is just like, you know, the, the the. if Michelangelo had been happy with one piece, then the others wouldn't have existed. Well, that, I, I mean, in my, in my opinion, no, no, I agree. And I, I think I'll take it one step further because while we're recording to tape, I guess we would call this right. Cause there's no live audience. <laughs> I still get nervous, right? It, it oh, could be you. Yeah. It could be my friend. It could be anyone sitting across from me, either in person or digitally on the platform. And I get nervous and I think I've finally, cause like, you know, you do this for long enough and people are like, well, when are you going to stop? Right. And I think I've gotten to a point where I can honestly say when I stop getting nervous before I go and record, because yeah. if I can get nervous, look, I, my mother was on for episode 50. And when I get to episode a hundred, I'm going to have my dad on. I still get, Nice. Like, I don't know my mom, right? Like, and I was still nervous <laughs> recording, right? So it's it's not right, yeah. it's not about who's sitting across from me, but if I don't get the nerves for whatever that says about me, I feel like that's when I have to reevaluate what this is. Mm-hmm. But I think it's the same for everything else. Repetition does help, though, right? Like, I've been a, 
a weekly blogger for like 10 years now. So like hitting publish every Thursday, the anxiety is not quite there. However, when I'm writing that first draft, it's kind oh, yeah. of a little bit there, right? And when you're editing and like the, it, it's still in the process. Yeah. And well, I think also like just like art in general is really vulnerable, like because what you're doing when you do any kind of art, in my opinion, like whatever your medium, if you're like a photographer or you're a filmmaker or like a musician, like what you're doing when you create that art is like attempting to evoke an emotion yeah. or at least like create one that people could find themselves attaching to for whatever reason. It's about relatability and also about, I, I feel, I think like in that, in that vulnerability, we're reminded of our humanity, yeah. which is why it's so beautiful. And, uh, and important that people keep doing it. I always try to make it a point with anything that I make to serve as a example or maybe not even an ex as an example or really just like proof that like you can make your thing. You know, if I if if this goober goofball can like make a living doing what I do, like I think anybody could. And I think that people now more than ever should be if anyone listening to this on the on your radio dials. If you're <laughs> if you've ever considered starting your own business or starting a podcast or starting a YouTube channel do it. Do it yesterday. Yeah. Because it's going to become required as AI takes away jobs. So besides, you know, why, why work for somebody else when you can work for yourself? Well, and that's, so the blog I started as a, a writing exercise for lack of a better word, the podcast, mm. I wish I had started sooner. Like I enjoy yeah. I enjoy this. I enjoy the discourse. I enjoy talking to creative people or new people, right? Like when was the last time you talked to somebody you didn't know? <laughs> you know? Well, I do, I do get to talk to, to new people because of the store. Cause working at the vape shop. Okay. But yeah. I know what you mean. Not certainly not like this. And so I like the, look, I'm not, I haven't figured out the merchandise aspect of it yet, but like bringing conversation back seems like my, my deal right now. Um, because like, I don't, I don't want to, you know, the, the dirty secret about this show is that if it turns into an interview, then my guest probably didn't want to have a conversation with me or was so nervous. And like, I, I think I'm good enough as a host that like by the second half hour or whatever, we're talking and conversing, but the interviews aren't fun. Like I want you to ask me the question yeah. or, or give me a thought provoking answer that like we can dissect together. That yeah. seems fun. Yeah, no, I agree. I think that, uh, and and too much lately has it gotten to be, well, I don't know. I, honestly, I don't have much frame of reference because most of the podcasts I consume are comedy podcasts. Like I just listen to like, most of the podcasts I listen to are comics. So like they're just being goo goofballs, silly goose, having a silly goose time anyway. Well, I didn't, that's, that's the, those were the podcasts I was listening to until I started this one. And now it's like, well, I'm, I, the, the truth of the matter is I listen to a lot more of your music than I do podcasts because I've, I turned a corner about two years ago, like right at the height of the pandemic where I went like, I love listening to podcasts, but music makes me happy. And I think I'm going to choose mm. happiness. Oh, and it doesn't matter the music. The music doesn't matter. Like that's, that's, oh, it almost doesn't matter. It's just like, yeah, I, I enjoy these people, these hosts and they're sharing their life with me and that's great. Or they're sharing their comedy or their craft but I just want to listen to some tunes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I should, I really should get back more. I do listen to music and this is not nearly as much as I did. Um, and I'd spoken, I've spoken before publicly about like, I used to work for this guy and in my early twenties who didn't listen to music like, and I thought it was insane. Like not I was at like, all? what are you talking about? Yeah. He, he was like, I don't listen to music. And I was like, what? And he's like, yeah. And I was like, okay, well, what's it? And now keep in mind, this is like, oh, wait, but I was like, well, what's in your CD player right now? And he was like, uh, a book about finance. <laughs> and I just, I, 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 he's, it seemed so alien to me. And now here I am at 35 and it's like, 
I mean, it's not that I don't ever listen to music, but like, it's not my first choice. I honestly usually will throw pod stuff on in the background of what I'm doing. I actually actively listen to music. I don't really listen to it passively. I usually listen to podcasts passively. <laughs> so do you like when you're talking about actively listening, do you like put on an album like and like start to finish or like, uh, and I usually, I don't have the detention span. I I usually, I, when I consume music, I usually do so through YouTube and I'm just like usually pulling it up by individual song okay. and it could be anything. I do have a, I do have a couple of playlists that are kind of like, have like a nineties hip hop playlist and like a ska playlist. And, um, <laughs> I actually have a, uh, a playlist that is game grumps remixes. Okay. <laughs> Uh, which I don't know if you've ever heard of or, or seen the game grumps, but they, uh, they're these two guys that do like let's plays, they play video games and I think they're really funny, but over the years they've said all these kinds of crazy things. And there's this guy, well, there's several people that make remixes, musical remixes of stuff that they've said or done in the games. And some of them are just really, really good pieces of music. Well, it's, it's funny because like, um, <laughs> Steph and I started getting into Minecraft content. Um, oh, okay. And so, um, well, we do watch like the big ones like Hermitcraft and, and Empires. What's funny about that is there's this subsect of fans that do create songs based on storylines or things people say in those games and they just put it out. And so like... <laughs> You can find it's a you, weird world. Yeah, I yeah, there's there's something for everyone, right? I mean, it, it's the yes, every movie everybody is somebody's has a favorite. Lane. Yeah, yeah, everybody's every, every movie is somebody's favorite. Yeah, well, I don't know, man. <laughs> you might be hard pressed to find. Well, the thing the thing about that is is that the worst movies you're going to find people that love either ironically or you know to be a contrarian like honestly man plan 9 is one of my favorites like unironically just because of like what it says about cinema and like what was going on at the time and the whole idea that Bella Lugosi died and then they just like put a dude on there and it covered his face up like it's just I, I I find that kind of stuff really interesting, and I've always been a really like big fan of B horror anyway. Yeah, I I'm trying to think of what I've watched recently, but like for me right now, I have this ongoing discussion about the the most recent Star Wars trilogy, where I'm like, I I it it was a popcorn flick. I enjoyed it. Like I I've I've finally separated my fandom from religion. I guess is the, is the word I would use. And like, okay. I can, I can accept that they had an impossible task, <laughs> right? Like I have a, I don't know what magazine it is, but I got one of those like sci-fi rags from like the early eighties that has mm -hmm. an interview with Lucas where he's like, yeah, we're going to do nine of these. And this is like before yeah. return of the Jedi came out and like, obviously before the prequels. So like even after the prequels, like going into this final trilogy, just the sheer fact that they were doing a f another three was amazing to me because of how uh, I don't I, how how the the prequels are perceived, right? Because like I I watched well, the first how, one. Remember how they're perceived now? Well, and, and they, yeah, yeah, because yeah. we were all at least myself included was under a bit of a spell of I think being so happy that it was just back. Yeah. Yeah. That we, cause like, I, I don't know if you've seen like, the, I, th I think it's red letter media is the name of the guy that, that rips episode one, just like so hardcore. He goes in on it. And like some of the stuff I think he's a little too harsh on, but a lot of the stuff I was like, wow, I just ignored this stuff because I was so happy for a new star Wars movie. Cause I was like, what? 13 when the, when episode one came out. Dude, I was crazy hype. Well, like, and, Star Wars was one of my favorite properties. And it's it's funny you bring it up because I, I watched uh, movies with Mikey. Uh, Film Joy did a, a series on Star Wars. And I literally just watched it last this past week. And he talks about the reviews and the fan and critical reaction from release week of all of these films. And it's like yeah. very different than how we remember oh, yeah. it. like vastly different like every, it's it's now cool to hate on the prequels 
right. but not not when <laughs> Not when not oh, no. release week. People loved it. Dude, they had those like remember those Pepsi cans you could collect that had all the Star Wars characters on them? You, like Yeah, no, I because I remember drinking a tw- a 24 pack of those cans <laughs> in line for the midnight showing, right? Like I, yeah, that was man. so like there's that piece of it where like and maybe look look, I never jumped in on the Phantom Menace hate, but that could also be cuz I stood in line with friends of mine after school for six or eight hours, just hanging out in the sunshine, you know, drinking way too much caffeine and like waiting for the midnight showing on a school night, by the way, which I still, still boggles my mind. Right. (laughs) Yeah. Well, nostalgia is a powerful drug, man. Like I feel like a lot of stuff gets away with like, I was just seeing this thing about, um, about NBA 2K and Madden, which I don't know if you're much of a gamer or if you play any of those yeah. sports games, but yeah. I like um, I don't I don't play Madden as much, but I usually play 2K. I like, I'm a big basketball fan, um, and I'm finally starting to see people speak up and allow me to be a person that speaks about up about this publicly to these to EA. I don't know what kind of lazy stuff they're doing with the career modes on these games or really just the games in general as to like any kind of advancements on the way they're played or their graphics. They've, for me, they've looked the same for 10 years. It's just been like a clone and we all keep buying it because we want to buy it. (laughs) Yeah. But it seems a little shitty that like they're not being held to a standard of improvement that like, I don't know any other medium is well, and like there's you, you and I get held to that. If we have a fan, like if you have a fan subscribes to your channel, like listens to the podcast, like the, they expect you, they expect a, a certain level of quality. Sure. But they also right. expect that after 10 episodes, it's not going to be just the same old thing. Like you're not going back to yeah. the well and doing the same thing. And yet I think bigger company, it, it, it's almost the nostalgia, right? Like bigger companies get a little bit of a pass. Some of it's it, it, it the collector's market of like, well, who's on the Madden cover? Who's got the cover? Blah, blah, blah. But like, I, it's also, I think online, I think because of the competitive aspect of the online play, yeah. they get away with a lot of it too. Cause like, I don't even play 2k online. I'm not a competitive person. I get 2k cause I like to just play. I yeah. like to, I actually treat it like a role playing game. Like I make my guy and he's got like a story and he runs through the thing. And like, I'll, I just play the career mode against the computer. I don't care about like flexing online, (laughs) but because that's so ingrained in the culture and especially when you add streaming on top of that, then, uh, you know, I mean, how much can we really blame EA at the end of the day? Because they're just, you know, people are still buying it. Like, it's not like people aren't buying the games. It's just that they're just putting out the same game pretty much every – and honestly, dude, especially this year, the, the essentially the 2K storyline for the basketball game this year for the career mode is that everybody hates you. <laughs> That's the storyline. It's just like it's you, you, it's you and another guy like your rivals in college, I guess, because it's not like you have any kind of college story in this one. And like literally the, the team that drafts you – didn't want you. Nobody, no. So, so I, I went with the Lakers because I've never played for the Lakers in my career, and I'm running a point guard. So, and I wanted to play with LeBron, so I went to the Lakers. Nobody wanted me. <laughs> That's the whole story. It's like, oh man, you're really gonna have to show them that you belong here. And it's like, what? Well, also, this, it, you wouldn't have come up with anything more dynamic than this. Well, with the exception that, like, that's true of any sport. Of like it's not even exactly. it's not even like unique to basketball. Like you you want to be right. a Formula One driver, an NFL quarterback, a, a major league <laughs> pitcher. Like you 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 have to show up and do the thing. You have to drive the car. You have to throw the strike. You have to throw the touchdown. Like you can't just yeah. I, you, you don't just get drafted to sit on the bench. Like <laughs> yeah, it's very very weird. It's I, I it's and it's just lazy. And and honestly, even stuff with like some of the cutaway scenes and stuff when you can just tell I mean, look, I don't know a whole lot about game design, but it's like you can tell that it's like, oh, well this is just lazy. Like I just got finished, I just got done playing the Hogwarts game. Which by the way, that's another one of those things I was talking about earlier with reconciling in my head as to whether or not it makes me a bad person. 
Yeah, but, I've, I've long since decided that like the art, it, it look, it, if it's not circular, it goes back to the art and the artist being separate. Like most of the people yes. are like there's like, you know, it's the ones that have an internal problem that we look back more fondly on than the one with the external problem. But that doesn't mean all of these creatives are 100 percent fine. Yeah. Like, well, and I also I'll say, too, because I wanted to bring this up earlier when you had said it, like separating the art from the artist. Like, I also feel like and maybe it's just lately, but maybe it's always been this way. I find myself far more in love with the world than the plot for a lot of this stuff. Right. So like Star Wars, for example, I love the original trilogy. Looking back at the at the prequels critically, it's not very good. And I haven't seen any of the new stuff other than Rogue One, which I did enjoy. But I guess my point is, like, I still love Star Wars, like, as an entity. Yeah. I just don't give a shit about what your new story is. You know? And I feel that kind of way with Harry Potter, too, because, like, I didn't even finish the trilogy. Or, or the trilogy. I didn't even finish the series. I, she lost me in the fifth book. I was in high school. I got halfway through the fifth book. I got bored. I put it down. I never finished it. And then I never really watched any of the movies actively. Um, but, you know, I was like nine or something when the first book came out. So when the game came out, you know, my inner child would not allow for me to not play it. Sure. Um, and I really enjoyed it. I think that it was good. I think maybe, you know. I think some people are probably going to argue that it's a little too short because I've I've completed the main stuff and I'm getting close to 100 percenting it. And I've, I haven't even put 50 hours in it. I, I would but, say I, I would argue that this also speaks to the art you create because you're creating worlds. Uh, as yeah. well. So I think it's just and, and, and you know what? I mean, look, I, I get to be the third party here because I've consumed your content and I'm talking to you, but maybe that's just it. Maybe the reason you enjoy the world is because you enjoy building the world. Yeah. I'd not ever considered that, but I mean, I guess that that's what this whole thing is with the additions is that it's just like, you know, once you, pl once you set up the quote unquote rules for Florida edition or so, well, that's a bad example because there's not really rules for that. <laughs> But like, you know what I mean? Like yeah. if you establish that it's like, okay, well this, in this episode, we're all, uh, you know, lawyers. Yeah. Then people that watch can take from that and whether they use that in their own game as the DM or they want to make a character that's based on that. Like that's one of the things that really attracted me to D and D is that it's really just like a collective of ideas. Yeah. Like that's essentially all it is. It's just like, hey, it's just a pile of ideas. Um, because like I was just talking, re I made a TikTok recently about how I want to make a spellcaster that's afraid to cast magic, <laughs> but he's like super broken, powerful. So every time he casts, he has to roll for fear. <laughs> <laughs> and because everyone else in the party knows that the spellcaster's uber powerful, they're going to encourage them to cast. I just think that that'd be really fun. Like that's that's my favorite thing. And honestly, it's a good idea that Justin started doing this thing where he builds these characters because that's another thing that I could probably do really well. And we could just churn those out at least weekly, if not a couple of them a week. As I said, I have watched the entirety of the Man Shorts YouTube channel, and Yazik's albums can be found throughout more than a few of my Spotify playlists. This is a means to explain that I was and remain a fan of the art that Charles Bates creates. But while we didn't talk much about process, the discussion made one thing clear to me. Charles Bates, the artist and storyteller, has an internal drive and a longing for the next thing that speaks through his creations to me as an audience member because we are similar in that regard. Rational people don't create, and Charles and I are hardly rational. We've been at it since before high school, trying things here and there until we figured it out and started sharing our creations with the world on the internet as we grew up with this interconnected digital world. We are vulnerable because art is vulnerable. 
And that is absolutely related to the realization that rational people don't create. It's all connected. All of it. So since Charles implored you to do the thing in this episode, I will ask you to check out his art, his music, his creations, and then go one step further. If you don't like what you hear, that's fine. But if you do, let him know. Favorite a song on Spotify, like a video on YouTube, email his podcast, or even this one. Consume from the independent creators and let them know what you think. It means so much more than you could ever imagine, unless, of course, you're also an independent creator. And then you know. Thanks for listening to The Palmer Files, episode 95. And now for the official business. The Palmer Files releases every two weeks on Tuesdays. If you're still listening, I encourage you to join the discussion. You can find all related ways to contact myself and my guest, Charles Bates, in the show notes. There, you can find links to watch Charles' content on the Man Shorts channel. That's M-A-N-N, as in YouTube.com slash Man Shorts. There, you can also find the D&D editions, Drunk Before Noon, and the video of his podcast, Bard Advice. You can also listen to his music on YouTube or Spotify by looking up Yazik. Again, that's Y-A-H-Z-I-C-K. Email can be sent to this show at thepalmerfiles at gmail.com. And remember, your home for all things Agent Palmer is agentpalmer.com. All right, Charles, do you have one final question for me? What is your favorite sport to watch? Oh, it's such a tough question. I, th- I think I want to go baseball because it was my first love. Um, really? And I, I love that it's slow. <laughs> I'm, okay. I'm the one. <laughs> I'm the guy under 50. <laughs> <laughs> still I mean, I'm, I mean i'm under 40 but i might as well say under 50 that's like i like the pace of the game i know they're speeding it up i get all that but like i i enjoy it that that's the one i and i say that because we're recording this on the verge of march madness which is one of my favorite oh. events but it doesn't yeah, make it my favorite sport you know what I mean? Like as an event, Mark, but college basketball, I couldn't say because like eh, some of the games in the early season, I don't really care about. And like, I love college football, but I love college football bowl season a hell of a lot more than some of the regular season stuff. So like there are moments, but as far as like just anything goes, uh, give me nine innings of baseball. Okay. I was wondering too, that there's probably a difference between whether you are maybe not for you, But at least there would be for me, um, whether you were watching it on television or if you were there. No. If you were at the game. I I don't think so. You would still say baseball. I would still say baseball. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think I would, I would, um, I would, I prefer to watch uh, basketball, but I would really love to watch cricket. Do you understand cricket? Like, yes, I do. Oh, I, see, and I'd like to watch it physically. Like, I'd like to go to like a perf- – I would love to see like an ICC, like a World Cup, like cricket match. All right. Well, one day when you have like six hours, we need to get on a call so you can explain <laughs> it to me. Because it's the one – like legitimately speaking, it's the one – It's not one that sp- complicated, really. All right. But it no really one's – it looks, it looks more complex than it is. But nobody's explained it to me. So it's the one sport I don't – like, and, and I will say – one of my favorite sports to watch that I don't watch very often, Aussie rules football. It's oh, it's okay. just so much batshit fun and crazy. It's got oh, I bet it's 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 the best of rugby and football, like our football, all in one. It's so good.
Yeah. Cricket is great because it's essentially and you you probably won't like this, but I, I can't stand baseball. Let me just say. I, yeah. And to each his own. Yeah. But that said, like from I think it's a better baseball. Okay. So for someone who doesn't like baseball, I think cricket is like what baseball should have been. In <laughs> fact, I think cricket is is what baseball was first. Yes. It right. Was. Yep. I think. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, with cricket, it's like 11 on each side, the, in the middle, you've got the wickets that are on either side yeah. and you've got a batter and a bowler. The, the really, the only thing that you have to like learn is like the rules as to like how many pitches and stuff, but okay. it's essentially baseball. The bowler bowls, the ball, the batter hits it. The goal is obviously if they get it all the way out, that's essentially a home run at six points. If they get the ball out of the circle with it being like on the ground, so like if it rolls out yep. of the circle, that's a four. Um, and then otherwise, any runs are scored by them running back and forth those wickets with the other batsmen. Okay. So um, it's really not as complicated as it looks. I learned how it worked in like, 10 minutes one day just by watching a video and like since i learned how it worked it's really fun to watch i'm that's now that's the thing i have to do yeah man i i would highly recommend it i'd recommend anybody watch cricket like it's totally a thing that was random the the player ab de villers was retiring and this was years and years ago when i saw it and and i like you randomly was like yeah, you know, I don't, I don't, I've never known how cricket works. And so just, I was like, I'm going to learn. And I learned and it's awesome. It's one of my favorite sports now. And it's like the second most popular in the world behind soccer. So 